It was July 13, 1996, in the beautiful hill station of Kodaikanal. A well-known tourist spot called Coker's Walk was bustling with visitors. Among them was a woman, around 40 years old, neatly dressed, standing with two large suitcases and a handbag. She looked like just another tourist, admiring the scenery, blending in with the crowd. After some time, the woman walked up to a nearby taxi. She asked the driver to take her to Kanyakumari immediately. The driver agreed, and as he moved to help her put the two suitcases into the car's trunk, she quickly refused his offer. Surprisingly, she lifted both heavy suitcases by herself and placed them in the trunk. It was clear she didn't want any help. The woman then sat inside the taxi, and they started their journey. But after traveling a short distance, something unexpected happened. The car got a flat tire. The sudden puncture made the woman extremely nervous, almost as if this small delay was a major problem for her. Little did she know that this puncture would soon turn her life upside down. Noticing her anxiousness, the taxi driver went to a nearby telephone booth and called for help. He contacted another driver and explained the situation. He assured the woman that another taxi would arrive shortly and asked her to wait for a few minutes. With no other choice, the woman stepped out of the car and began to wait. After a short while, another vehicle arrived, and taxi driven by a man named Raja. What the woman didn't know was that Raja was about to change the course of her life. Who was this woman, so desperate to travel from Kodaikanal to Kanyakumari? Why was she so anxious? This incident would lead to the shocking and gruesome murder case, one that took place 28 years ago. In a small village called Payanur, located in the Kanur district of Kerala, Dr. Omana Edadan was born on November 24, 1953. She came from a simple middle-class family. Despite their financial situation, her family ensured Omana got a good education, and she joined medical school. In 1981, she proudly completed her studies to become an ophthalmologist, an eye doctor. Omana was known for her intelligence and brilliance throughout her college years. Soon after, she married her college sweetheart, Dr. Radhakrishnan, a pediatrician. Together, they had two children, and for a time, life seemed perfect. Omana had a respected position in society and a family she adored. But things took a turn when Omana wanted to renovate their house. She asked her husband to take charge and meet with some architects and engineers to get the work started. However, Dr. Radhakrishnan, who was very busy with his medical duties, said he didn't have the time for this task. Trusting his wife, he gave her the responsibility to find a suitable architect and handle the renovation on her own. That's when Omana met Murali Dharan, an architect from Payanur. The two of them discussed the renovation plans in detail, and soon, the work on the house began. But something else started along with the house renovation, a relationship between Omana and Murali Dharan. What started as professional meetings slowly grew into something more, crossing the boundaries of a regular friendship. At the time, Omana was 37 years old and was feeling very lonely. Her marriage to Dr. Radhakrishnan was strained, as both were extremely busy with their medical careers. If Omana worked during the day, her husband had night shifts. This left them with very little time to communicate or share their feelings with each other. In this lonely space, Omana found herself getting drawn to Murali Dharan, and before long, an illicit affair began between them. Omana was deeply in love with Murali Dharan, and showered him with gifts and money, allowing him to move in with her. Over time, their relationship became more public, and eventually, Dr. Radhakrishnan and his family found out. Devastated by the betrayal, Radhakrishnan separated from Omana, taking their children with him. However, Omana didn't seem to care. She was so consumed by her feelings for Murali Dharan that nothing else mattered. With no one left to stop her, Omana openly began living with Murali Dharan. But as time passed, her social standing started to suffer. People began talking, and her reputation was taking a hit. Feeling the pressure, Omana asked Murali Dharan to leave his own wife and children and marry her, 
Muralitharan was already married with two children, and although he enjoyed the gifts and money Omana provided, he didn't want to leave his family. This difference led to frequent arguments between them. Still, whenever Muralitharan needed money or gifts, Omana willingly provided them. At one point, Omana came up with a plan for them to escape to Malaysia and start a new life together. She even went so far as to create a fake passport. Omana traveled to Malaysia first, and after a few days, Murali Dharan followed with his own fake passport under the name Syed Ali. Once in Malaysia, they married using their false identities. But Murali Dharan never intended to stay with Omana for long. He was using her for her wealth, gifts, and resources. Unaware of his true intentions, Omana began working as an eye doctor in Malaysia, thinking they could finally live a happy life together. Omana, blinded by her love for Murali Dharan, continued to give him all her money. But things started to change when one day, she told him that she had no more money left. This sparked a huge argument between them, and after the fight, Murali Dharan returned to India. Soon after, he began calling her from India, begging for more money. Being all alone in Malaysia, Omana found it difficult to refuse. Even though she had nothing left, she started sending him her jewelry. It was only after this that Omana slowly began to realize the bitter truth. Murali Dharan had been using her all along for her money and gifts. With this painful realization, she stopped sending him anything, no money, no jewelry. Sensing this change, Murali Dharan switched tactics. No longer using sweet words, he began to threaten her. He warned Omana that if she didn't give him what he wanted, he would report her fake passport to the Malaysian government. This new form of blackmail became unbearable for Omana. Desperate to escape his threats, she told him she would return to India soon, bringing money and jewels with her. But inside, Omana's feelings had shifted. She was no longer the same woman blindly in love. She had grown angry and resentful towards Murali Dharan. Omana, knowing that leaving him wouldn't be easy, devised a clever plan. She knew Murali Dharan wouldn't stop his threats if she simply walked away. So, using her intelligence, she began to think of a way to end things once and for all. If you've watched this far, don't forget to hit the like button. It really helps support the channel. Thank you. In 1996, Dr. Omana decided to take a break from her work and applied for leave from her clinic, setting her dates from July 7th to July 14th. On the first day, July 7th, she traveled to Thiruvananthapuram, heading straight to her brother's house. There, she safely stored away all her valuable belongings, suitcases filled with items, including jewelry. She made up a work-related excuse and left for Uti without raising any suspicion. Upon reaching Uti, Omana booked herself a hotel room, using a fake name to avoid detection. She was preparing for something big. The very next day, July 8, 1996, Omana visited the local market. Her shopping list was unusual. She bought several bundles of plastic bags, two suitcases, a sharp weapon, and some other small items that seemed trivial but were going to play a major role in her next move. After gathering everything she needed, Omana switched hotels, once again booking a room under a false name. This time, she made the booking for three days. With everything set, Omana made a crucial phone call to Mira Lidharan, the man who had been part of her life and her plans for quite some time. On the phone she spoke sweetly, saying, It's been a long time since we last met. Why don't you come and see me? I have a surprise for you. Stay with me for three days, and then you can take the money and head back home. But remember, don't tell anyone you're coming to meet me. Hearing Omana's invitation, Murali Dharan was thrilled. On July 9th, he eagerly traveled to Udi, arriving at the address she had given him. That night, the two spent time together at the first hotel, enjoying each other's company. The next day, July 10th, they set out to explore the beautiful town of Uti, but before doing so, Omana had another plan in mind. She had already booked a railway retiring room where they stored their suitcases and other belongings. 
Once everything was safely stored, they spent the day sightseeing and enjoying the peaceful town. After a day filled with fun and laughter, they returned to the railway retiring room later that evening. But before heading back, they made a stop at a bar. Omana encouraged Morali Daran to drink heavily, making sure he was intoxicated by the time they left. Once back at the room, Omana revealed a small vial of liquid to him. She smiled and said, This is something special. Once injected, it boosts a man's strength four times over. Morali Daran, drunk and eager, responded, Then what are we waiting for? Give me the injection now. Without hesitation, Omana prepared the syringe, filling it with the liquid from the vial and injected it into Muralitharan's body. But this was no ordinary medicine. It wasn't meant to enhance his strength at all. Omana had carefully planned this moment, bringing a lethal poison all the way from Malaysia, knowing exactly what she was doing. As a doctor, she was well aware of how the poison would act. Within moments, the substance began to take effect, and soon, Muralitharan's body became motionless, lifeless. After Muralitharan fell lifeless to the ground, Omana quickly dragged his body to the bathroom, her heart racing, but her mind focused. She carefully made small cuts all over his body to ensure that all the blood would drain out, creating a horrifying scene. Once she was satisfied, she began the grim task of dismembering his body into tiny pieces, so small that she could easily flush them down the toilet. She didn't stop there. She also removed his organs, slicing them into even smaller bits before flushing them away as well. Omana worked tirelessly throughout the night, fully immersed in her gruesome task. By the time dawn approached, most of the work was nearly complete but she knew she had to vacate the railway retiring room by July 11th. Determined, she wrapped any remaining body parts in plastic, packing them into the two suitcases she had brought along. Once everything was cleaned up, she called for a taxi to take her back to the hotel where they had spent their first night together. Upon arriving at the hotel, she continued her horrific work. Omana cut the remaining body parts into smaller pieces flushing them down the toilet with grim efficiency. But no matter how much she tried, she knew it was impossible to dispose of the entire body this way. Two days had already passed, and she needed to think of another plan. That's when she remembered Kodaikanal, a well-known tourist spot in Tamil Nadu. It was infamous for its deep ravines, where some people went to end their lives. Rumor had it that anyone who fell into those depths would never be found not even their bones. With this chilling thought in mind, Omana decided, I'll throw these suitcases into the ravine and no one will ever know what happened. She quickly made the suitcases smell nice by spraying them with perfume. She also wrapped the leftover body parts in plastic, making sure to add more perfume so the smell wouldn't escape. Two days had gone by and the hot weather was making it harder to hide the odor. Still, she managed to pack everything into the suitcases, called a taxi, and loaded the heavy bags into it. She told the taxi driver, Please take me to Kodaikanal. When she arrived, she was shocked to see a large crowd of people there. With so many people around, it was impossible to throw the heavy suitcases down the hill without being seen, which was too risky. If she tried, she could get caught right then and there. So... Omana asked the taxi driver to take her back. Her luck was running out, because, as they started to head back, one of the taxi's tires got a flat. The driver called for another taxi, but by then, a lot of time had already been wasted. And then, the second taxi arrived. As the taxi drove a short distance, the driver, Raju, began to notice a strange, foul odor filling the air. His curiosity peaked, he turned to Omana, who was sitting quietly in the back seat. Madam, what's in those suitcases? There's a really strange smell coming from them, he asked, raising an eyebrow. At first, Omana tried to avoid the question, giving unclear answers and shifting in her seat. But Raju wasn't fooled. Feeling trapped and desperate, she finally admitted, There are human body parts inside. I killed someone. 
and I still need to get rid of the rest. I've already taken care of half the body, but there are still many pieces left. If you help me throw them away, I'll pay you a lot of money. Raju's mind raced as he thought about her scary confession. Okay, he said slowly. Tell me what to do next. Omana felt a wave of relief wash over her and told him to drive to a lonely place where they could get rid of the suitcases without being seen. With the plan ready, she soon felt more relaxed and fell asleep, thinking that Raju was now on her side. However, when she awoke, her heart sank as she realized the taxi had come to a stop. She looked outside in disbelief to find they were parked in front of a police station. Raju was outside, shouting at the top of his lungs, there's a dead body in my taxi. Panic flooded Omana's mind, but it was already too late. The police had quickly surrounded the taxi, their uniforms flashing under the sunlight. As they approached, she felt a cold dread settle in her stomach. When the officers opened the suitcases, a wave of horror washed over everyone present. Inside, they found human body parts, grotesquely dismembered, and barely recognizable. After that, Omana openly admitted to her crime in front of everyone and explained her reasons and who the victim really was. When all the evidence and witnesses were presented in court, she received a life sentence. However, in 2001, she applied for bail. It's important to note that Omana wasn't a natural criminal. She wasn't violent and behaved well while in prison. Because of this, her appeal was granted, and she was released on bail. After that, she vanished in a way that the police still haven't been able to track her down. In October 2017, a report came out about a woman in Malaysia who had committed suicide by jumping from a building. It turned out that this woman was from Kerala, prompting a notification to the Kerala police. However, another woman claimed that the deceased was her sister, not Omana. To verify this, DNA tests were conducted on both women, and it was confirmed that the body belonged to the woman's sister, not Omana. Even though the deceased woman's face looked similar to Omana's, the DNA results and her age told a different story. To this day, no one knows where Omana is, or if she is even alive. If you have any information about her, please share it in the comments. And if you're new to our channel, don't forget to subscribe and help us reach 40,000 subscribers. Thank you.